Um, it was about defending the mining communities from a highly politicised uh, onslaught. Uh, and that while there were obviously economic causes for the confrontation, uh, this, there was a huge political element. Uh, the Prime Minister at the time, Mrs Thatcher, uh, correctly saw the need to defeat the miners as a way of trying to defeat the whole labour movement and uh, used this phrase, the enemy within, which I'm sure many of you know. So uh, this was about attacking communities. I mean, in a way, this, this is very relevant link to um, the film uh, we've just seen. So I, I, I guess the first point, by way of introduction, is um, what I see what we're doing today, what we're talking about today, as 100% a continuation of that, completely uh, a continuation. But first of all, the miners' strike was... I mean, the other thing that I, I, I hold in my memory about the miners' strike, and a lot of the strikers were... Um, so I was in my late 20s, and the people who were most active on the picket lines, the young miners, were generally a few years younger than me. And this was not for them, actually, about spending their working life in a black hole in the ground, like their fathers and grandfathers had. Because anybody who's even, I mean, I've never gone down a dip and done a shift, but I mean, you've just got to go down one a couple of times to realise that nobody goes down there by choice. Um, and uh, this was about their communities and about their life and about the things that uh, the people in the film uh, were talking about. So, of course, because of the, the, the political side of it, no one talked about alternative types of work. Nobody talked about preparing or investing in a transition. Uh, I, I mean, that just didn't even, you know, that just wasn't even on the agenda because it was about trying to destroy those uh, communities from the government side. Um, so when we talk today, I, I know that uh, the one of the subjects that the organisers want to talk about today is, you know, how do we envisage a just transition from uh, North Sea oil? Um, we're concerned about defending communities no less than we were in 1984-85. And I think, I mean, certainly from my experience of the trade union movement, I mean, we just have to, uh, we have to oppose every time uh, leaders of of unions, and let's name names, the GMB, uh, every time they open their mouths and try to do this thing of jobs versus climate policies, I mean, just, you know, go and take a running jump, right? Oil workers have grandchildren too. They can see what's going on in the global south now with climate change, just like all the rest of us can, because we saw the retired mine on the film. You know, you don't have to be a brain surgeon to know that uh, 17 of the 18 hottest years ever recorded have been in the 21st century. Um, you know, the, the, the people can see what's happening around them with wildfires, floods, and all the rest of it. Um, so, you know, don't give us the false choice of jobs versus uh, climate policies. So, I think that's a, just a kind of starting point um, of how we uh, how we tackle these issues. So, um, big issues and how they play out at uh, local level. Um, I'm not a climate scientist, and uh, I, I can see from the audience here, uh, I'm sure everybody is aware in the way that I am, as a, you, know, you read the newspapers, you look at the reports and so on, I'm sure everybody is aware of the climate science. I suppose what's uh, one thing that I've tried to think about over the past couple of years, and I think it's really important to talk about this when we meet, um, is that, you know, you sometimes, I don't wake up in the middle of the night that much, but you know, you sometimes walk in along and think, my goodness, you know, this, this thing is actually, you know, if it goes wrong, if we don't stop it, this is like disaster on an absolutely kind of unimaginable, uh, scale. So I think, I don't want to talk about the science, but I'll talk a little bit about you know, how do you actually get your head, or how do we collectively get our heads around what um, you know, the, the consequences of, uh, of climate change are. 
So the first thing I want to say is that, um, that and the, some of the scientists I think make a mistake by, by not acknowledging this, um, when you actually read the reports, and not only the ones by the IPCC, which have a kind of political element where they're always trying to show that the system is going to solve the problem, but when you read the stuff that's actually written by the scientists, um, there, there's, of course, because they're predicting the future, there's just an enormous amount of uncertainty. So uh, you're on a scale between bad and absolutely catastrophic, and you, you can't actually know uh, where you're going to end up on that scale, um, and because, partly because there are so many moving parts. But I, I mean, I think the other thing has changed. I think the other thing, I think the reason we've one of the reasons we've got this huge movement amongst school pupils, which I think is just the most important thing that's happened uh, in anti-capitalist politics for quite a few years. Um, I think part of the reason is because it's so visible now. Um, I, I, travel quite a bit for my work to Russia, which is a country where, like the United States, you've got a government which is quite into sort of climate denial. And what friends and comrades were saying to me there uh, last week is, I mean, there's this real change. That the government's really backed off because they've had these wildfires in Siberia, which have absolutely destroyed kind of huge swathes of forest. Um, so I think it's, it, you know, I think it's becoming visible in a way now that, uh, particularly in the last couple of years, we've had these hot summers and so on. Uh, the volatile weather, and people are starting to understand this. So this is no longer a, a, a sort of Hollywood disaster movie thing in the future. It's very clearly something that's un, uh, uh, unraveling now um, in, uh, in, in all kinds of places. And we also saw that on the, the, the excellent material from Real News. So, um, I think there are some uh, nightmare scenarios. I think you know I try to get my head around those as well. They mainly concern uh, you, you know you can you can have sudden changes. You can have ice sheets melting, which then pushes the sea level rise up a lot quicker. I mean, climate change produces sea level rise, but you could it, it could go up a lot quicker. And those are things that could happen over the future decades. Um, if nothing is done. But I don't think nothing is going to be done. Uh, uh, when you go to the demonstrations with the school pupils, you think something is going to be done. Um, I think the other thing is, and again, it's been uh, very clearly, uh, that's the conclusion from the film, is that uh, you, know, you can't, this is, this is not about, this, this is not about taking climate change as, a, as an individual issue. Um, it's connected with everything else, and that's certainly uh, been uh, quite active with the people from Extinction Rebellion in the part of London where I live. And I mean, that's one of the conversations we're having there: is that you know, you, this is this is not one issue. This is connected with all the other things. And uh, I, there's been quite a bit of stuff. There's, a, there's been quite a bit of stuff said about the role of climate change in producing. Uh, the catastrophe that's been visited on the people of Syria in uh, recent years. Um, and there's, there's, there was an article produced which showed that there was a, a drought from 2000, I think, seven till 10. There were four really serious years of drought. And that definitely increased the uh, rural to urban migration, which goes on in countries like Syria anyway. Um, and it increased the social problems in you know, basically shanty towns where people live, as they do in many countries in the global south, in huge numbers. Uh, and that all increased the pressures. Um, but I think you have to say that uh, some of those things are going on in other neighbouring countries. And um, you know, what actually uh, triggered the uh, events in Syria which led to the civil war was a popular uprising combined with the government, which would rather basically uh, shoot at its own civilians constantly uh, than uh, give way on democratic demands. So you've got a way in which uh, the, the, there was this climate problem. It's fed into uh, a, a long, you know, a long-standing dictatorship with a long-standing record of locking up anybody who protested about anything the government did about anything. And it's then produced that, that the Arab Spring has come along, which is obviously across a whole number of countries, and it's then produced that 
crisis. So then you get, you know, you, a few years later, you then get people writing articles in the Guardian saying, you know, this was a climate change produced event. Well, no, it wasn't. Uh, climate change was obviously one element in this crisis. But I think uh, the point about that is, uh, oops, we, we, you know, this is all part of the same thing. We discuss everything. I'm not suggesting we particularly have a discussion about Syria, but I mean to make the point that this is what's going to happen over and over again. There's never going to be a thing where, oh, it's just about climate change. It's always going to be that combination uh, that Sean was talking about. Um, right, I've talked about the... And that's going to be here as well in, in the UK in different... And I suppose what we want to talk about is, you know, how, that, that, how those different bits are going to unfold uh, in the UK. Um, I've basically said what I wanted to say about the school students. I mean, I, I, and I think as well, um, when you... When you come into political activity at a younger age, um, I mean, I got involved in the movement against the Vietnam War when I was at school when I was 13 years old, and there was a group of us. I think that's very different from the experience that other people have uh, if you come into politics at university. Or, you know, you're already, it doesn't seem like a lot from the age I am now, but actually the difference between 13 and 23 is an awful lot. Um, so I think one of the things we got with the schools, I mean, this is a huge number of, I mean, I think numbers wise, those demonstrations are just, you know, many times bigger than the whole Vietnam movement put together already, right? And that's a, a lot of countries, a lot of people coming into politics uh, for the first time. And the problem they're dealing with is not going to go away. And, uh, you know, you, you have an anti war movement, and, you know, 1975, it actually came to an end, the demand we had, we get out of Vietnam, they were chased out. Um, now, obviously, this, uh, the, the problem that the school students are dealing with is, is probably more complicated than that, I would say. Um, right, just, uh, 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 I've got another five minutes, right, to talk about the Green New Deal? Yeah, yeah. yeah? Okay, so, um, uh, uh, the point of talking about the Green New Deal is, so, we're, we're going to be looking at how do we, um, you know, how do we put these issues together? Um, and uh, the North Sea and, and so on. So uh, maybe this forms a bit of the background. Um, we have a resolution that was passed at the Lake Valley Conference. There are a lot of... Uh, uh, the Lake Valley's not quite such a thing in Scotland as it was uh, before. But uh, certainly what we've seen in, in England is, you know, a lot of activists going to their uh, constituency in branch meetings. I'm sure it's happened up here in the late party as well. It was the top, uh, I think it was the most popular resolution for the conference. And there's a, a bunch of young people in uh, Labour for a Green New Deal who kind of motivated this and pushed it. And it was a fantastically successful campaign in the way that these campaigns are done in the Labour Party. They got this resolution through, the unions kind of came along and grumbled about it union uh, bosses and they were pushed back and the resolution went sailing through a conference, it's got a lot of very radical, very good stuff in it so it's, uh, there's a retrofit program, so uh, certainly part of the if we're talking about reducing fossil fuel consumption fossil fuel consumption is the main cause of greenhouse gas emissions, greenhouse gas emissions are the main cause of global warming Reducing fossil fuel consumption, a very good way to do it is to stop the uh, sort of consumption that is wasteful, which uh, means you have to burn the fossil fuels in the first place. And obviously a really good way to do that is insulate people's homes so that they don't have to burn so much uh, fuel uh, for heating. So there's a massive retrofit program is in there. Uh, investment in renewables, it's another kind of, you know, it's something you completely can't go wrong with. Uh, to put masses of renewables on the uh, electricity grid. There's a strong recognition in the resolution of the need to work together with the movements in the global south. It's a good uh, resolution. However, uh, when you look at what the Labour Party is actually doing as a party on climate related issues of different kinds, the picture is much more mixed. And so, um, 
my conclusion is that what you've actually got is a series of battles unfolding. And uh, I think this is, again, is a pattern we're going to find repeated because I think with what we've already found with the Parliament uh, adopting the quote, climate emergency, unquote, um, it, a major problem. And it's, I mean, so again, going back to my comparison about the Vietnam War, it's kind of, I mean, you're either fighting a war or you're not, right? It's pretty kind of difficult to dress that one up. But I think there's an enormous capacity here which, and which we're all going to have to learn to deal with for politicians to dress up their pro-fossil fuel anti-action on climate change actions as being the most wonderful green actions uh, that have ever been uh, dreamt of. And I think that's a very sophisticated machine, and it's not, I mean, oil companies are kind of a bit easier to spot, because that's the way they're making money, is taking oil out of the ground. It, it's, you know, I think it's a bit easier for us to see the kind of, um, the, the greenwashing there. But I think there's a, it's, what I see in the political sphere is just increasingly sophisticated levels of greenwashing. And you get that in the labour movement too. So that's one of the things uh, we have to sort of deal with. So just a few. So these battlegrounds that I think open up on the Green New Deal. So the, so the, the day the resolution was passed, then Rebecca Long Bailey, who's the, the opposition spokesperson on these things, she straight away announced big investment in electric cars. As and this was together with the uh, Green New Deal. And um, and we can discuss this. Is, part of the stuff that I know a little bit about. Um, if you, the, the electric engine is twice, approximately twice as efficient as the internal combustion engine that burns diesel, right? So you put the energy in, you get about twice as much miles or kilometers or whatever out of that energy. But if you're producing the electricity in a power, in a power station which is fired by gas or coal, don't forget, as you drive past the power station, you see all that steam going up out of the chimney, right? That's because average power station efficiency in the world is around 33, 34%. And some of the really super duper new gas-fired power stations, you can get that up to 55%, but that's physics. You can't do any better than that. Um, so you're losing two thirds of the energy content. So, you know, you're minus two thirds uh, just to produce your electricity. So the fact your electricity engine, your electric engine is twice as efficient um, uh, is not helping you. So in a greenhouse gas terms, an electric car is not necessarily, unless you're in Denmark and actually producing most of your electricity from renewables, it is not actually getting you anywhere in terms of greenhouse gas. It's a survival strategy for car manufacturing companies. And this is, this is really important. These are the sort of things I think we have to talk about. Um, the other thing, transport infrastructure projects, uh, 115, I think, Labour MPs uh, voted for a third runway at Heathrow. You know, if you build more runways, you get more planes, you get more air companies offering more people, more cheap flights, uh, and you put more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. I mean, that's another thing. You know, we have to talk about. Um, and the one we've had in South East London uh, is the uh, Silver Town Tunnel. So uh, they got, we've got the Blackwall Tunnel, big traffic jam every morning, and they want to build. So Labour Party uh, at London level, wonderful plan to solve this problem. Uh, if you go on their website, you see all about the bike lanes and everything, but don't try and like actually drive a bike on them because suddenly they come to an end and. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not good enough. Um, but, you know, the, the project which is underway, is, and it's a lot of money that are planning to spend on this Silvertown Tunnel, so we've had a campaign opposing that for a long time. And, I mean, what's quite interesting what happened with that campaign is it was a kind of heroic band of green warriors, um, and, you know, everybody else is doing campaigns about other things, but the, the Extinction Rebellion and the school students, I mean, it's actually really revived and we've actually the most stubborn Labour Council which was ours in Greenwich uh, and, and which had held out and was supporting the tunnel the two others on the north side of the river were actually opposed to it and ours has now sent a letter to Sadiq Khan the London Mayor saying we've, we've got some questions about this tunnel we're, we're having problems justifying it uh, so 
But you know what we've had, we've had you know we've had meetings. We've sat down with Heidi Alexander, who finally you know deigned to find a three quarters of an hour in a diary to meet people after all these demonstrations and lobbies and everything. Uh, who's the deputy mayor for transport? Which is actually telling us that <coughs> this tunnel would reduce the number of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, which, to put it politely, is kind of post-truth politics. So. You know, that's it. So on the one hand, we've got this fantastic resolution at the late body conference, and I don't take nothing away from the young people who organised the campaign for that. It's a fantastic job. But at, in that same Labour Party, at the same time, you're fighting these very specific battles. And I, mean, I haven't spoken about North Sea deliberately, because obviously, you know, why am I going to come to Scotland and talk about something that you already know about? But I mean, you know, I think you'll find the same thing when we talk about just transition from North Sea and so on. We're going to have those same sort of political battles. Thank you.